Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Today on our econ show, we have a lot to cover, but we'll try to condense it because there wasn't as much um, new data coming out, so nothing too crazy. It's just going to kind of be a bit more of a, a recap and some new data points that have reinforced a lot of the things that we've said so far. So when you look at what we're going to talk about in segment one, we're going to go through, again, that global tightening, what is happening to the industrial side manufacturing, which has continued to slow a bit, especially on the back of what's happening in China. And we also want to look at what is credit demand looking like? What is how is that shaping not only just the U.S., but also abroad? At, and then who where would we be if we didn't talk food and uh, and uh, supply chain in segment one? Now, segment two is going to look again at the U.S. and we're going to focus a bit more on what do we see for Q3 GDP? What is happening with inflation as we continue to see the commodity spot index going up? and a lot of these drivers of inflation and how is that kind of shifting things in general. Segment three, we're going to go through uh, housing, the debt ceiling. We want to look at what it, where do we sit on the debt ceiling now that we've passed that little stopgap. Uh, and then how are things sh- shaping up for housing, housing prices, underlying costs, and then where does that fit within the inflation story? Then we're going to look at Europe and inflation has just taken flight. <laughs> it's just... It's not funny, but it's funny because, I mean, everyone, I think, thought this was going to happen and now it's coming true. And what does that mean going forward for Europe? And then in segment five, we're going to look, obviously, at China, but we're also going to look at emerging markets in general and and some of the pressures that we've seen on the monetary tightening side as well at the and then the fiscal in terms of where some of the trade is. And then looking at some of the new data sets that have come out of China, which show things have continued to get worse. Uh, and not better as we head into and through Q4. So one of the things that we just wanted to start off with is um, is when we look at what has happened so far in the Permian Basin. So one of the things that we want to look at is Permian Basin is now pushing back to a pre-pandemic high. Uh, that's something that I think we'll, we're going to eclipse by the end of this year, just given where the activity has come. And it's important when you think about how the U.S. is going to continue to grow, where that growth is going to come from, and it's going to remain on the back of the Permian as we head through the end of the year. But you know, back to uh, where global monetary policy looks like. So this is what we've been talking about when we look at emerging markets and the tightening. So as we've been saying for the last couple of months, uh, we've now shifted fully into a rate rising cycle. And it's really on the back of emerging markets. Now, developed markets are continuing to move up. There's a lot of rumors that you're going to see another shift up in South Korea, which is very likely just given where inflation sits right now. But emerging markets are really going to be the driving force and will likely take out that 2019 high that we had as we came out of 2018. And we'll start to see that good closer to where we've been, not so much in 20, uh, uh, in 2010, but closer to where we were in 2008, 2009. And one of the interesting thing is, things is it's happening right at the same time where we're coming past peak on the global manufacturing output side. Now, things have leveled off. You know, Obviously, we've had the recovery uh, post-COVID from Asia. That's putting some of that stopgap in. That drew some of, some of it down. But it's it's not that we're exploding back up. It's just we're getting back to this 50. So you're seeing some of this essentially slow down when you look at what has happened within the developed markets, you know, past peak, you know, starting to, to, to level off and emerging markets pulling us further towards that 50 level. And what is really driving that? And when you look at global manufacturing supply delays, starting to get a little bit better, but still well off, uh, still at, you know, uh, all-time lows when you look at this metric, you know, going back to 1998. But you're starting to see some things balance out, some things catching up a bit. Not that we're improving significantly, but we've essentially stopped going down. But companies reporting supply delays and labor shortages as a constraint on output is at an all-time high going back to 2005. Now, remember, this is on a global level. So this is not just a U.S. issue. This is not just a developed market issue. This is a global problem, excuse me, that continues to reverberate through the system, keeping prices elevated, keeping just pressure on that supply chain throughout the market. 
So then rounding that out, global backlogs of work and new orders. So as we've been saying, new orders have been coming down. You know, China, it's in contraction. When you look at a lot of these other areas, you're starting to see contraction. And, and that means below 50 on new orders, though the backlog continues to go up. So again, if you haven't received your current orders, you see where prices are, why are you going to order something new? And that's where we continue to see this disconnect between new orders and backlog. You know, realistically, new orders will likely uh, flatline here. They're not going to continue to come down because we'll start to work through some of these backlogs and that'll help support some of those new orders. But again, you're still seeing that disconnect that remains within the system. And the reason why is because uh, when you look at search activity, more than 70% of global economies are still showing concerns about supply chains. So it's everything from semiconductor, supply chain, truck driver, bottlenecks, everyone from Asia, Europe, North America, continues to see a lot of these issues in general. And you can look at just where the search trends are. COVID is now negative. When you look at people searching for COVID, it is now pretty much driven uh, holistically by what is happening in the supply chain and how we continue to see these issues in the system. And here's why. Supply chain bottlenecks have become a hot topic on investor calls. So when you look at investor calls, it's the most common thing talked about. It, it now either is at the same level of mentioning to inflation or it has eclipsed it depending on what sector you're looking at. And that continues to be, I think, this overhang that remains in the system as you as we head into Q4, which is again holiday shopping, holiday you know trying to get things ready for the holidays, and this is a lot of that panic that we continue to see in the system, and this is why trade peaked in March and has been moderating since, with container and air freight uh, indicators showing dramatically slower growth rates. This is down to due to down to restrictions and supply chain issues, as well as artificially high Chinese exports during the pandemic roll-off. So you're starting to see some of this normalization as you get a lot of these things on the water. And now it's not so much that you need new product, it's you need to get the product that's stuck on the coast into your system. And that's where you're starting to see those backlogs remain elevated and the issue with new orders. All the while, and again, this is any any of this can change when we when you start projecting out 10 years. You can see that there's that that longer term damage in terms of redirecting the growth rate that is expected from GDP with the expectation that we won't be back to growth until 2022. And a lot of that is, is in terms of the long term damage. And, and I think the ones that this is where they're starting to get right is when you look at, I, I think China has a much bigger impact in terms of where they're going to be post this. But it's really, I think, um, when you look at the Eurozone in India, I think they're very correct in terms of where that, that pain is going to be, just given the long-term trajectory. The U.S. has tried to do uh, offset that by just, obviously, significant amount of stimulus. But I think China is going to see a longer-term impact from this Again, anything can change. We could we could reinvent we can invent cold fusion by 2025, and things can change. So it, it's it's just a it's just a projection, you know. And that's why I think it's important to to think about where we are in that global cycle and how far are we past peak. Which is why I think this chart is really important when you look at valuations, because as you approach this 80 to 90 percent, you're moving closer to late cycle um, or peak cycle, if you will. And that's where we always talk about. We've already seen some of the these data sets roll over. We've start we've seen GDP come down. We've seen manufacturing come down. We've seen the supply chain create these impacts, and now that has created additional impacts to the consumer. The consumer struggling more and more as even though some parts of the wage uh, scale are going up, others are falling. And and again, even when you factor in wage increases, inflation is still outpacing, which is creating some of this late cycle growth, which, we, which means that we're moving further and further or closer to a potential, not, not so much a recession, but more of that slowdown that could lead into a broader recession. But again, let's just talk about slowdown first as it continues to accelerate and we'll kick off segment one, looking uh, segment two, looking at the US. And a lot of this is being driven by energy prices on top of everything else. So energy prices indexed to November, 2020. 
you can see that the coal price explosion has really started to increase that on the Chinese and on the China energy prices. So Chinese energy is always fixed. And then when they, the NDRC allowed prices to moderate and fluctuate, it was on the back of coal prices. So that really just came in with where the EU is, where U.S. energy prices still remain fairly low on a glo globally speaking, uh, when you look at where things have shifted based on LNG prices, coal prices, and how that is going to impact not only manufacturing, but also the underlying price of said manufacturing, which is going to increase what the export levels are going to look like and what those prices are going to be for especially people in the U.S., and what does the weighting look like? So now that you're starting to see some of this moderation coming backwards, containers weighting off Hong Kong, uh, Shenzhen uh, hit new highs post -comp uh, Compasso. And again, when you look at uh, container ships in port, container ships weighting here, we're now back to these elevated levels due to the typhoon, due to the issues that remain on, uh, on shore in terms of just where demand is. Now you have a renewed COVID uh, problem within, the, um, the, within China, which is gonna create more issues, more slowdowns, and again, just prolong, I think, this well into now 2022. So on the positive side, when we turn to soybeans, when you look at planting of soybeans in Mato Grosso, Brazil, uh, it's favorable so far. As of Friday, 45% has been planted above last year's 8%, an average of 26%. Planting, and planting had progressed at a similar fast pace in 2018. Uh, 2019 was also fast, but again, 2020 was a bigger issue. And then this is just looking at the amount of ships that continue to, to, be, to just sit and wait to offload containers to come through. And the reason why we talk about this after talking about soybeans, because we still have a lot of soybeans coming into China. So you have these shipments sitting there unable to get in. So what happens to the beans waiting offshore? Do you risk rot? Do you risk, uh, you know, some, some loss of cargo? You know, there's going to become a, a bigger reverberating issue, not just on, I can't get containers off my ship. I can't get food off my ship, which is going to create a bigger issue when you're looking at the, the food side and the consumer side, when, especially within China which is why when you look at some of these shifts on what they're buying, they're tr diversifying again. Uh, U.S. corn export inspections continuing to move back up. We should take out that high. And then when you look at soybeans, we're going to continue to push up as we continue to see more go into the international market, i.e. China. And then the container ships at Los Angeles and Long Beach Port hit record levels, have started to come off as they've agreed to stay open 24-7. Oakland has said they can take additional cargoes, which is shifting some of that into the north. So again, all, trying to do everything that they can to try to normalize and get some of these through. But now you're getting, uh, now that we've offloaded here, gotten some of those, those containers back on, sent them back into Asia. Now Asia is having additional problems, i.e. China, as we just spoke about, which is going to create, again, more problems that are going to take us well into 2022 in terms of some of these restrictions. So now that we've talked about that, we want to look at what is happening within the U.S., what is growth looking like, and then how is Q3 you know, going to come through, and then what do we expect in Q4 as these inflationary pressures start to accelerate again after cooling off into the back end of Q3 and now accelerating into the early end, uh, the, the beginning of Q4.